And if you're going to like come to my party, you better be bringing something. And if nobody comes to the party other than the people that are already here, it's still a great party. So I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A gay and a non-gay. James and myself are both obsessed with this film that's on um, Amazon Prime right now called Dating Amber. And amazingly, we both started watching it. We didn't even talk to each other about it. And then we both happened to watch it. Um, and I messaged James going, oh my God, you've got to watch this program, Dating Amber. You're going to love it. And you'd already seen it, but you'd never, you didn't even mention it to me. Yeah, no, I was watching it exactly the same time, but it's literally the most beautiful film ever. I mean, it's triggering as everything is right now, but it really reminded me of growing up gay and how difficult that is. And I guess for you, Dan, not having grown up gay, um, what was it like an eye opener for you? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Um, <laughs> so should we explain what it's about? <laughs> well, we could, but we've also got a guest on the podcast, so maybe they should just explain what it's about. Good idea. Um, <laughs> please welcome Lola. Hi. Hi. <laughs> So Lola, um, you play Amber in Dating Amber. Yeah. Um, tell us what it's about, I guess, if for people that are listening that haven't yet seen it. Uh, so Amber and Eddie are two gay teenagers in uh, Kildare in rural Ireland. And they both um, decide that in order to stop people sort of taunting and speculating about their sexuality, that they'll be each other's beards and form a fake relationship. And then they fall head over heels in platonic love with each other and become a really lovely integral part of each other's coming out stories. Oh, it's like you and I, Dan, isn't it, in a way? <laughs> uh, like, kind of. <laughs> and you've actually got the real life beard going as well. <laughs> yes, I, uh, this is the real beard. So James, did you, did, is, this, is this a thing? Is this a thing that, that, that gay people do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny though, you know, Lola, like I don't think I had a beard that knew she was my beard. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. So I She's dated. <laughs> yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's really interesting because in the movie, um, there's a lot going on. And obviously Theon's character isn't that happy being gay and doesn't want to come out, isn't ready to accept who he is. So kind of, falls in love with you or thinks he's falling in love with you for real. Um, and I guess I did that too with a girl, except the girl I dated was actually um, straight. So yeah, when I was younger, Dan, I did have a beard, but I mean, nothing happened. <laughs> we, we didn't even hold hands. Like it was crazy. <laughs> Is, is I love this, that there's like the hand holder is like, I'm not even, but there's this scene where like Eddie tries to hold my hand and it's like, ah, uh... I actually don't even want to do that. That's a lot of contact with somebody I don't want to have contact with. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot. Like holding hands with someone is deep. It's, it's quite a difficult thing to do. And I think I did yeah. eventually hold her hand, but we never kissed. Like I never kissed her. The first time I kissed a girl properly was in a gay bar in Brighton. And it was like truth or dare. And I had to kiss a girl. And it was the worst thing I've ever had to do in my life. <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect. <laughs> so how much of this story is, is true to your life, Lola? Well, I grew up and like from a really young age, I suppose like I knew that I was queer, but I didn't sort of feel like I had the terminology. Like I spoke in an interview recently where they were like, who was your first crush? And I was like, well, it's really funny because I remember watching the film Hitch and being attracted to both Eva Mendes and Will Smith and being like, this, I should definitely only find one of these people attractive, what is going on? And then in my like early teenage years, I sort of found the term bisexual and I used that for a really long time, but something never really quite fit and it didn't feel like me. And so I suppose I sort of always knew that, but sort of squashed it down. And then it was actually really through doing this film that um, I'd given so much weight to Amber and what she was going through and her finding herself that I sort of decided that I needed to give myself that. And that's really when I found the term queer. And, and as soon as I started using that word to describe myself, I feel like it was the biggest weight off my shoulders. I feel like I completely transformed as a person. I became really comfortable with myself. And I feel like I just managed to detangle years and years and years of like compulsory heterosexuality and heteronormativity and things that I didn't even realize I was squashing about myself and, and hadn't been 
honest with myself about and through playing this character I mean it was like artistically really gratifying but in in terms of my personal life it, it's something I can't even put into words. It's really interesting hearing you say compulsory heterosexuality I really enjoyed that because it kind of feels like it is compulsory and you don't yeah. feel safe to be yourself and to come out and um I don't know just hearing you say those words was really powerful I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that before. Yeah well it's like even I, I felt like you know I, I'd been in relationships with with men and been in relationships with women but for some reason something was always different and I had all of this shame and this guilt that I just had decided I wasn't even going to think of and I've had a lot of friends who've talked about you know the idea that they you know might be attracted to women or attracted to people of the same gender but they don't know if they could pursue it romantically and I've sort of started saying to them do you think that that's because you know that's not for you and if it isn't then that's fine but how much do you think of that is is compulsory heterosexuality the idea that you find them attractive but pursuing it is something so different because you're expected to just be in a heteronormative relationship over to you dan <laughs> <laughs> um that, that that is a really interesting point actually and is is there do you think there's people who are I don't know, uh, not not bisexual, but but are, are like a little bit straight, and they just think, but it hasn't even occurred to them that that, that 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 they that it's worth even exploring, not doing that because, it, like like you say, it's 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 almost compulsory to be heterosexual, so you just go along with that without even sort of questioning it. Is that is that sort of what you're getting at? I think that like, it's just a thing that a lot of people and I. I talk to people now more openly than I did and talking to people my age there are so so many people that are like yeah I found myself like sexually attracted to somebody of the same gender but you know I don't know if I could be in a romantic relationship and I I think that a lot of it is to do with compulsory heterosexuality it's to do with the images that were fed growing up it's to do with what we see in the media with the songs that we listen to and I think that because things are shifting so much now that a lot more people are just starting to think about it because we have the labels, we have the language, we have the conversations happening, whereas before we didn't, you know, and it's, it's something that, you know, people always use the term spectrum, but for a lot of people, sexuality falls on a spectrum, but it's a spectrum that they can't explore because they, I suppose they just haven't had the platform to think or, or speak about it. Yeah. So unbelievably, Dan and I have both done the Kinsey scale test and I was fully gay and Dan was fully non-gay. I, I still find that like it can't be true because I believe so hard in this, this spectrum of sexuality. But there are people on either ends of the spectrum just as much as there are people in the middle of it. Absolutely. Um, do you know, and it's, it's this, this whole thing. It's like you get to define what you are. And that's what I love about the, the label queer is that for me, I get to define the label. The label doesn't define me. And I was really lucky growing up. I had incredibly supportive parents. And, and that's why I find it so funny that I, you know, hadn't given myself that sort of thought and space before because I had great parents. And my daddy rang me after he watched the film and he was like, you know, I heard my mum say, she was like, you know, people keep asking me, what what you mean when you keep describing yourself as queer and I've just said that it's just you and that's who you are and that's who you've always been and I was like crying and then my daddy took the phone and he was like you know what I think we all have a bit of rainbow in our veins somewhere and I was like go on dad <laughs> so this is amazing really that you didn't if you hadn't done this film you wouldn't be identifying as, as you are you'd still be yeah, I think I'd still be using the term bisexual. Um, I think it was just, you know, it was the term that was most available to me when I was younger. Um, it made the most sense. Um, but it, it is funny because I think you just know in yourself if something doesn't feel right or sit right. And for me, that label means so much more than just who I'm attracted to. It's who I am as a person, you know, how I present myself in the world and the things that I'm interested in. Like, it's an entire massive wonderful beautiful umbrella term for i think everything that makes me up wow oh, that's really, <laughs> yeah that's really beautiful it's um it's funny trying to explain what queer is and what the difference between that and bisexual or gay or, or lesbian is because i don't even know if i get that right as a gay person mm -hmm. and i'm throwing both dan and myself under the bus here but i guess i think queer means 
that like you say it's lots of different facets of your personality and it means you're not attracted to binary people yeah. it's not just a man or a woman it could be yeah. Uh, you could potentially end up in a polyamorous relationship as well. Like it's just completely open. Is, is that right? Yeah, I think you're just sort of open to the idea that that for you, it's always a person. You're open to the idea of it being people. You're you're sort of just open to everything and that, you know, you don't see like gender identities and things as binary. Although like, you know, I identify as a woman and I use she, her uh, pronouns. I think that, you know, some days I wake up and I feel completely different to the way I felt yesterday and and that's fine and and I think that I squashed a lot of the way that I presented myself in the world um and I think what's funny is that like at 14 I was so much more comfortable with it and then I got into my late teens and early 20s and sort of just went back into this insular compulsory heterosexual sort of bubble and I think that's just because I was around lots and lots of straight people during that time yeah Interesting. Um, so the other sort of amazing thing that's happened off the back of this film is, is you've got a, a real life IRL BFF <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in 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 Fion. Um, so are, yeah. are you? Do you guys live together? Well, yeah, we're currently isolating together. We sort of like we say we live our life like cat dog, like that cartoon of those like two things yeah. just each other. Um, <laughs> we we. Matt and we, well, we met before we filmed it, the chemistry read, and sort of hit it off from the word go. We sat and we chatted for like an hour after the edition, and we just knew that we were going to be best friends. We had the exact same sense of humor. Um, we're into all of the same things. And so before we even shot the film, we had months of just like this budding, lovely friendship. So by the time we got on set, we were completely comfortable with each other, and it really felt like, you know, life imitating art because, you know, Amber and Eddie are platonic soulmates, and I, I feel like I found that in film. Are you living together right now in lockdown? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> are you going to do other movies together? Please, can you not ever separate? Well, <laughs> that's what we want. Like, that's what people keep saying. Like, would you, I'm like, I'll work with Fionn forever. I'll work with Dave forever. And they're like, do you want to play like Irish LGBT? And I'm like, yep, yeah, Irish LGBT characters forever. Like, <laughs> I'll do it. You're going to be like the gay Beyonce and Jay Z, basically. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's interesting that the movie was set in the 90s because Dan and I have, have spent time in Northern Ireland and also Ireland. And, um, when I got off the, the bus in, in Dublin uh, at the airport, I heard this mum say to her kid, like, he, he didn't want to get in the muddy puddle. She called him a faggot straight away. And I thought that was so shocking because this guy, this poor kid was like four years old or something. And, yeah. um, and we've, we've talked to a conversion therapist in Northern Ireland and, and things are not easy, um, certainly in Northern Ireland, which has been called the most homophobic place in Western yeah, Europe. So I'm from, I'm from Belfast and it's, it's, um, I mean, you've got people like Arlene Foster <laughs> running up there. So, you know, what do you expect? Um, yeah. it is horrifying. Like a lot of people sort of ask us in interviews and they ask about it being set in the nineties and how far we've come. And I'm like, you know, just because things are written into law doesn't mean that socially we've caught up that casual homophobia is still so prevalent and it was prevalent in my school and it was prevalent in Fionn's school and it's prevalent on the streets and in the way that people talk to their kids and I think also when you run in like liberal circles it's easy to think that it's gone further but this is a little pocket town and it's absolutely still present you know so it's like it's set in 1995 but you could definitely set it now yeah and we were going to ask like did if you said it now would it be that different no I don't think at all not at all. I mean, you've still got like, um, I just, it, it's really sad. I mean, I was on set um, and it was a really lovely moment actually, but it just felt like it was like, gosh, we're setting this film in 1995. I'm sitting here filming it. And between takes, I was on Twitter and marriage equality had just been passed in the North of Ireland. And I got like teary and I felt completely overwhelmed and it felt really beautiful to be on set of this film. But then I was like, God, it's like, 24 years after this film that marriage equality has just been passed in the north wow. you know and in actually in 1995 when we set the film um it was only two years after homosexuality had been decriminalized in ireland so these kids that are coming to terms with their sexuality 
two years before, you know, they were seeing themselves as criminals, not just, you know, uncomfortable or unsure. They were criminals. It's, it's wild, isn't it? I mean, so James and myself um, have spent quite a lot of time in Belfast and we made a documentary, a BBC, a BBC documentary about conversion therapy. And um, we met loads of LGBT people in Belfast. And a thing that kept coming up over and over again is this is like part of the UK. And it feels like it's Russia, <laughs> to, yeah. to put it extremely. But, but it does. It really does feel like a million miles away from, from where we are. Um, and the, the conversion therapist guy who we spoke to, he was like, oh, but you just think we're all backwards over here. And we're almost like, well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, specifically you, because you're doing this horrendous... <sighs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's so difficult to talk about. And actually, I, I, we did not plan to talk to you about it, so I don't want to get into it too hard with you. Um, no. But yeah, it was it was very triggering <laughs> yeah we have people talk about the film and talk about we, we've heard people um speak about the film and some people are like well why why don't they just fall in love and i'm like well because then it's an advert for conversion therapy you know it's like you just haven't found the right boy yet like that's not what we're trying to get across these two do love each other and you have to get past the idea that the only love that's important is romantic these two people are soulmates they are head over heels in love with each other but it's platonic and that's yeah. okay <laughs> you know yeah exactly like dan and i i think <laughs> yeah <laughs> i um actually i want to ask you a question Lola, because i don't know if i read this to dan even but one of the listeners to our podcast we met in in belfast when we were there sent me a message the other day and this was literally a year later from from the day we met this listener and um he wrote me a message saying I was talking to a guy on a dating app a few weeks back, but I had to stop because of the shame and guilt that I felt towards wanting a relationship with another guy. I don't think it was just that moment that made me feel shame, but it definitely amplified what I felt in the background at a low level for a really long time. I was wondering if you had any resources or suggestions for dealing with shame for being gay. It was really strange timing because like I said, it was exactly a year after we'd done that documentary, but also the night I'd watched Dating Amber, which is set in Northern Ireland. So it was bringing a lot of emotions back to me. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on that and how, how to cleanse yourself of that, sh <clears throat> of that shame? Yeah, I think that was something that like, I, I think I'm even still um, detangling when people talk about it. I think it's because from the moment that you're born, that's the idea of normal that you're fed. So deviating from that in any way feels wrong. And that doesn't mean that you think it's wrong or that you think that you are wrong or the feelings are wrong, but it's seen as a deviation from what normal is. So obviously that's gonna feel odd. And I think it takes years to detangle that. I think it's, it's such a, it's so funny because some people think that, you know, the second that somebody comes out, that that's, that's it, it's all like rainbows and glitter and it's all fine and it's great and you've said it now so you're happy. And that's just not it at all. Um, and I think that the only thing that you can really do is surround yourself with people who you can talk to about it on a level who you're not afraid of saying anything in front of, who you're not afraid of sharing those feelings with and also like the ability to change your mind on something and and explore and and for me it was really finding somebody like Fionn and a lot of the friends that I've made in the past few years where I could just have an open dialogue and and not have to make decisions on anything straight away and just have that space to sort of figure myself out because I was never given it before because it it was just expected that I was going to be a certain way. It's almost like I think this is how I've kind of dealt with it. It's like the shame, actually, it's not really ours. It's what society has kind of put on us. Yeah. And actually, it's not really our problem. We no, and not really feel that. that. When we talk about like LGBTQ people fighting for rights, it's like, well, it's grand that we're doing it. I mean, but the onus isn't on us. It's on the people who aren't giving us them. It's not really <laughs> my problem. It's your problem. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's that's. <laughs> oh, I'm no, I'm not denying anyone their rights. I'm, 
And you know what? Dan's an amazing ally. Like, <laughs> yeah. 